Thank you for the kind introduction. And um, it's great to be here. I really had a great time putting together this show because it brought me back to uh, an important aspect of the trail building mythology, uh, particularly the, um, the, ask the uh, involvement of Myron Avery, who has become a little bit of a caricature over the years, the, you know, sort of labeled as the doer, rightfully so, because he rolled up his sleeves and got so much done. But there's also an aspect of Avery that also um, has come to fore, which is that he was almost inhuman, um, that he was not a warm and fuzzy guy, which is largely true. But through the character of Walter Green, um, the, the larger than life persona of Walter Green, we find a very human side to um, Mr. Avery that not many people are familiar with. So I'm really pleased to present the Walter Green story as it relates to the 100 mile wilderness. To go back to the beginning, uh, most of you probably know this part of the story. Um, quite simply speaking, ben, Benton Mackay was the idea guy. He came up with the idea for the Appalachian Trail in 1921. Um, he was recovering from his wife's suicide in a part of New Jersey that was uh, very rural, and he had come to the conclusion that in parts of his life that had been very trying before, um, most notably the death of his father when he was uh, 14, he took to the woods to find healing and nature was a great healing source for him. So it's only natural that um, fast forwarding several decades, he came up with the idea for the Appalachian Trail as a place to escape and rejuvenate. But as I said, he was an idea guy. His original plan was to go from Mount Mitchell to Mount Washington, which is important to our story. Um, and he also laid out a map, which I think was very integral to the success of the trail, even getting off the ground. Um, his article went into great detail about the reasons why the trail should be built. And interestingly enough, um, it was not only recreational, it was economic. Um, he saw that towns around the trail would benefit from having the trail go through them, which is something that we don't often uh, hearken back to, but it's an important aspect of why he wanted the trail created in the first place. But in his map, we see uh, that the trail goes from Mount Mitchell to Mount Washington with some side trails that he had drawn in for the future to go from urban centers to connect with the trail, which we all know also came to pass. But when you focus in on the main part of it, it does end at Mount Washington and there's really nothing going on up in Maine. Um, the total intent was for it to end at Mount Washington, the original intent. The thing about Mackay was, again, he was a great idea guy, but he wasn't a great project manager. And so he sort of tried to promote the trail and get it off the ground by himself. And he put a lot of energy into doing that, but it wasn't really, it had, it had entered the public consciousness, but, um, he wasn't really making the headway that he needed to. And what's really important is just two years after he came up with the idea for the trail, a uh, community planner named Clarence Stein actually went to Mackay's house in Massachusetts and had an intervention and basically said, listen, the way that you're going about building the trail, is it's not going to happen this way or at least in our lifetimes probably. And it was Clarence Stein who actually came up with this concept of, of having hiking clubs form and develop the trail in their particular parts of the, of the AT. And, and they would therefore 
take ownership of where the trail was placed, but they would also be very involved in the care and feeding of the trail. Um, and Mackay thought that that was a provocative idea, which he largely ignored. So um, he kept trying to do it on his own. And we all know that that wasn't working. So in 28, Judge Perkins took over for about a year, but he realized that he didn't have the wherewithal. He was recently retired. He needed a young buck to take things over. And that's when Myron Avery of Lubeck, Maine, uh, then living in DC, came on board. And, um, you know, by this, by this time, the AMC was getting more and more involved uh, in the New England region, obviously. And um, the AMC's official stance was that clubs are, in fact, the answer for getting the trail built. And the trail begins to take off largely because of efforts like the AMC and the PATC and other, other clubs that were forming. But there was a sticking point with Avery, and that was um, the AMC was adamant about this clubs first, then trail um, concept policy. And Avery quite simply said that will never happen in Maine. We don't have enough people to make clubs happen. We need to do it, reverse it. So it's like field of dreams. If we build it, they will come. Um, so he was hell bent on getting the trail built in Maine by himself, whatever he could commandeer. Um, and part of this is the fact that he was trying to commandeer this whole project from his office in Washington, DC, as he was holding down a full-time job. So he's trying to build out the rest of the trail on weekend trips. And it's really apparent that if he wants to build the trail to Katahdin to get that done, he's going to need some help. Um, he was very, very familiar with Maine, not just because of the Lubeck connection and going to Bowdoin College, but also he had spent years, more than a decade, researching the original trail routes in and around Katahdin. And he had interviewed a number of outdoors people, hunter, hunter, hunters, fishermen, guides, um, storytellers, uh, historians. He, he had a great deal of insight into the original trails um, around and up and on to Katahdin. Um, so in 1927, he was up there. This was even before he got involved in, um, in building out the trail. He was already up in Maine, uh, connoitering around this article I found um, about his exploits up there in the Katahdin region in 1927, including the Klondike, believe it or not. Um, so he had the familiarity with the region and his first thought in getting the trail built out was take, take an easy route, use the sporting camps and the logging roads particularly in the early 1930s, he had um, a lot of logging roads that, it, that he could take advantage of to make the trail building easier in places. But he also realized that um, particularly because of the depression, he had an, an inn that he could approach the uh, sporting camp owners and say, you know, you're really still during the depression, you're, you're moderately busy in the spring with fishing and you're moderately busy in the fall with hunting but there's that bridge season and what if we built this trail across your property would you give us an easement to do that and in return we'll promise uh, a number of people walking through that will come to your lodges for um, dining overnights etc and almost all of them, of course, signed on because the prospect of making some money, any money during the depression was uh, quite a, quite a uh, carrot at the end of the stick. So he did have some success with that, um, very good success with that, but there were still big sections of the 100 mile wilderness, most of it, that um, he could not bridge that gap. Um, 
and so in one of his trips up north, kind of connoitering around um, the Katahdin region, he bumped into Walter Green, I think it was in 1928, um, who would later write, I by chance met Mr. Avery just north of Katahdin. This chance meeting led to a lasting friendship, which I value very dearly. It's, it's almost, um, I mean, even, even for those of us who have spent a great deal of time in uh, Baxter State Park, if we could go back to the late 1920s in our mind and imagine this sort of Dr. Livingston moment happening, uh, there was no trail where they met. They met in a clearing um, just north of Katahdin, probably somewhere between Katahdin and South Branch. And, uh, you know, what are you doing here kind of thing. And they got chatting and they real he realized that uh, Walter Green would be a great asset to him in getting the trail built in Maine. And there he is. Now, what, one of the things that's really interesting about Walter Green, as we will find out, is he, he was famous and he had a following and what's really perplexing is there's really, there are really, I think, three pictures of him that are um, easily findable. He was actually, when he wasn't in uh, public performance mode, he was a very private person. So who was this quixotic Walter Green? Um, he was born in Baltimore in 1872. He was actually a Broadway actor. Uh, he appeared in 17 plays in 35 years, starting in 1901. He spent his winters in New York City at a, at a club called the Lambs Club. And he spent his summers on Sebec Lake and he'd much rather have been on Sebec Lake than in front of Hollywood or uh, Broadway audiences. But um, that was his way of making a living. I, I guess he was good enough at it that he was in 17 shows. And he was also a registered Maine guide. He also um, supposedly, which also there are some references to and so after some of the trail building trips, um, he had a still that he had built behind his camp um, and made a quite famous drink that uh, people enjoyed after coming off a week or two of trail building. So that also sort of snuck into his legend. I, I do wanna mention this Lambs Club just to give you an idea of how much esteem this fellow was held in. Um, these are all people that were also members of the Lambs Club. Lionel Barrymore, Irving Berlin, Charlie Chaplin, John Wayne later on, um, Spencer Tracy, and Fred Astaire made the famous comment, when I was made a lamb, I felt I had been knighted. So, um, you know, when the, when the winters came to Sebec Lake, um, Walter would would um, head down to the Lambs Club and uh, hunker down for the winter. Excuse me. But as I mentioned, his passion was nature, and it comes out in his voluminous writings. Um, when I was researching my book, Blazing Ahead which is uh, basically a sort of biography about Mackay and Avery. Um, there were 15,000 letters that Avery had written or, or received in the uh, state of Maine archives. It's just a phenomenal, and that's just all trail related, 100% of it. Um, and a great number of them are from Walter Green, um, correspondence back and forth of Walter Green. So Walter Green, to the extent you can read his handwriting, um, is very passionate about nature and it comes through um, in, a, in a 1929 early letter that he wrote to Avery. He said, once in a while here, you hear an owl hoot not too far away. It always has a spell for me, something that carries the spell of the wild to me more than any other sound. I wander the woods a bit every day. So, you know, who of us hasn't felt that um, 
connection with nature and need to be outdoors. That's why we're all here tonight for sure. But um, he was very evocative and um, emotive in his writing. And they're, they're a kick to read. Um, he also wrote in the same letter that when I first came to Sebec, it was a primitive wilderness. The years and the auto and the kicker, which is a kicker was a brakes, the brakes you would hear on the trains have changed it. Too many people, too much noise. <laughs> 1929 on Sebec Lake. <laughs> if only, if only Walter knew. So the challenge was was pretty uh, audacious for Avery and Green and a guy named Helen Taylor, Helen Taylor, if you prefer, um, who was also a famous trail builder has a trail on Katahdin named after him and was in the main forest service and built much of the trail uh, from Bigelow South. Um, but this is the map that they um, had in 1932. And you can see it's a solid line pretty much. There are a couple dots there from Mount Oglethorpe in the South all the way up to Maine. And I'll zoom in a little, I think this works. So you can see, I mean, basically most of Maine had yet to be built out. So that's what they were up against. And thank God for Walter Green um, and a few others. And this is where the personalities of the two men really come to the fore because the one thing that they had that pulled them together, at least initially, was the love of the trail concept, the love of being outdoors. But they were incredibly different. In fact, they couldn't have been more different. Um, Avery was pragmatic. He was all about progress and process. Um, he typed almost every letter that he wrote was typed. I think part of that was because he was working for the government and had an, an admin that could type everything up. He was unbelievably prolific. He would... I think the most he ever wrote in, a, in an evening after work was 17 letters, 18 letters. And oh. most of these were not one page letters. They were um, as many as five pages, some of them single spaced. Oh. Um, and everything was about the trail, everything. Um, one, one thing that I found is in looking through and I read every one of those letters there's one letter that mentions up until the point he meets Walter Green. There's, um, and even including the first half of his relationship as a friend with Walter Green and cohort. There's one mention, it's a three letter, three um, line paragraph, the end of a letter where he says, you asked me about my family. I, I think I should probably mention to you that we just had a son. Um, you know, which which was practically uh, the only mention of family in all of that correspondence. He kept work and family separate. And um, most of the time he left family at home and went out to build the trail. His son, um, Hal, actually told me, and he had told this to other people as well, that um, he had an ex had, would have the experience of running into his dad at home and he said it would feel like a reunion. Um, he saw him so rarely, he would leave early Saturday morning to go cut trail somewhere in uh, Northern Virginia or Southern Pennsylvania or something like that. So then you run up against Walter Green. I think they both had a lot to teach each other and maybe this is why they became close. Um, Walter was a romantic, he was an actor, he was, he was um, about the process. He, he wrote everything by hand, um, much to everyone's chagrin, not just, not just Avery's, but every uh -huh. researcher who has ever tried to decipher. Mm -hmm. And um, he was about nature. He wasn't necessarily only about the trail. Um, he was about the experience and he wrote often Two, two to three page preambles about what was going on in the woods 
and the observations he had made. And you can see the steam pouring out of Avery's ears as he's reading this, thinking, I just want to know how much trail you got built. Um, I don't need all that. And he would actually write that. And Walter didn't respond. Um, Green's handwriting and narrative drove Avery nuts. Um, this is this is good handwriting here, um, uh, but you can, uh, and you know, it, the thing is, he would not sharpen his pencil; would get lighter and lighter, and it would get worse and worse. And this is page three of a seventeen-page letter that he wrote, oh um, and and so it's hmm. it's hard. I was I was laughing with two other researchers about it, um, Dave Field, who you probably all know. And a guy named Mills Kelly, who's down in George Washington, um, George Mason University, and um, we we were in tears laughing about it. It's just, oh my God! I spent a half an hour trying to read a page of Walter, but it's mm -hmm. it's it's good. Um, and here's one of Avery's responses: I struggled as of old with your last letter. He he felt like he was making headway with him, and then it all came crashing down. I struggled as of old with your old, with your last letter. I wish sometimes I didn't know there would be so much of interest in your letters to keep me struggling for the gems. So you can just see Avery with all of this correspondence trying to struggle through. And uh, that's just the way it was. You got what you got with Walter. Um, in the spring and summer of 1933, Walter Green plays more than one third of the AT through the 100 mile wilderness. And um, mm -hmm. that wasn't the way that it was uh, planned. Um, they, they had actually raised money through the New England Trail Conference, as it was then called, the consortium. Um, they had raised money and paid a fellow who was um, a guy named Harry Davis, who owned a spruce gum farm up near Monson. Um, his son was going to build the trail um, through at least um, probably half of that one third. And then it was during the depression and um, Harry Davis wrote back and said, you know, my son actually found a job picking apples that pays more than it, it would pay to uh, build this rugged trail through the wilderness. So I think he's going to decline. And Avery blew a gasket and basically shamed Harry Davis and said, you, if, if your son won't do it, you need to do it. And uh, it, things kind of came to loggerheads and lo and behold, Walter Green ended up doing it. And uh, he was 61 years old when he did the barren chairback section, which was 29 miles <laughs> um, by himself with an ax and a pack basket and a can of um, uh, Myron Avery certified white titanium oxide paint with two inch by one inch blazes. Thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, or six inch by two inch. He was very exacting. Um, after the fact, um, he was physically, mentally, professionally, and as a result, financially broken. He sent a lot of really heartfelt article uh, letters to Avery saying um, that was really, really difficult work. Uh, I didn't get paid um, and there are no jobs on Broadway. So here he is living in a cabin during the depression by himself and all of this stuff is weighing on him to a, um, a not healthy degree. and. They started uh, letters back and forth about that. Um, depression era acting jobs were hard to come by and Avery did his best to bolster his friend. Um, he offered him um, recognition, feeling that um, what actor doesn't love recognition. That was something he could offer that would not cost him money. Um, financial help when possible. He actually got the New England Trail Conference to send 25 bucks to Walter Green to help him get through it. But spiritu spiritually, he was kind of uh, really beaten down by that. And so after, after it was all over, Avery sent Green, and this is very telling, a 15-page handwritten letter. 
handwritten as one word, not written letter. Um, so he wrote a handwritten letter, which he never, ever, ever did. Um, he did it for a couple of reasons. One is that he could pour his soul out in private to this fellow and tell him that he really cared about him, which is something you never saw from Myron Avery. Myron Avery had, by this point in his career, alienated a lot of people, including some of the leadership of the AMC, um, almost every guidebook publisher <laughs> in, um, had, in, in fact, one publisher wrote him a letter that in the first paragraph said, well, now you've done it, Myron, you've even alienated an entire industry. The publishers are all mad at you now. So, I mean, he was abrasive, no, no doubt about it, but not, but not to Walter Green. And this, I think, is a, a great insight for me and a, and a great comfort to me that um, the humanness of Myron Avery came out in this letter and, and going forward in his relationship with Walter Green. It is one of the most compassionate letters in all of his correspondence, probably the most. Um, there, there are some other ones coming down the pike, um, but it, it's, it's a, it's a not seen side of Myron Avery. Um, most of the other people in his life never saw the side of him, including to a degree his son. Um, he had a very special bond with Green, particularly. I think he owed him a great deal of uh, gratitude for finishing out the trail in Maine uh, under really trying circumstances, both financially and um, just trying to get it done from Washington, DC. And this is part of that letter. Um, if I lose your friendship or esteem, this trail isn't worth it. I mean, wow. Um, this is from the guy who's poured everything he has into it and ultimately dies young because of it. Far better that it never would have been open, but far more practical is our problem. We can't drop this work now. We can't let go. You're a much publicized man and your reputation is involved. It grows with each article. So he's trying to pump him up. Um, you know, for a few years, we've got to keep the trail in Maine open, you and I. So you know, he, he's also realizing at this point, and he's very afraid that no one's, no one's ever going to use this trail, which, um, you know, is something for us to think about now. Um, but he was, he was afraid that they were going to get the trail built and no one was going to use it. So the other part that I won't get into much tonight is this whole publicity machine that Avery's trying to build at the same time to try to get people to discover the trail. So Walter Green has finished that 39 mile section of the 100 mile wilderness. And then Avery and three others invite Green to walk the 100 mile wilderness with them that fall. So in September, they do what they call the trail building trip. I, they brought cans of paint to blaze with and axes and saws and they cleaned up the trail from Katahdin to Blanchard a distance Avery reported quite Avery like to the uh, New England Trail Conference as 119.1 miles and uh, you know that included the 39 miles blazed over Baron Chairback by Walter Green of course. How do we know the point one part? This is hilarious. Um, it's that bike wheel. Um, I found a um, Becky Fullerton of AMC, God bless her, had gotten a scrapbook from a woman uh, in Arizona whose grandmother had the scrapbook. And when she died, she told Becky that she was going to send the scrapbook and she got it. And she had gone to Katahdin in 1933 and saw Myron Avery and his crew hiking through. And there he is with the bike, the, the famous bike wheel. 
and she had typed up in in her um, scrapbook this account of bumping into Myron. Everywhere he goes, he takes a bike wheel for measuring trails. And if the trail is, according to his measure, a tenth of a mile longer than the guidebook give, gives it, he lets no grass grow under his feet before he writes to the club and tells them about it. So, you know, once again, incredibly precise Myron, who was never seen without his wheel. Um, you can go through all the archival footage and I think um, up until the point that the scrapbook showed up, there was one photograph known to be in existence without, uh, with my, of Myron without the wheel in it. Interestingly enough, um, she says there he is with his wheel. So he's, he's, he's already famous for having the wheel. Um, his group had already done something like hiked 130 miles in two weeks. But here's the funny part. I put this in because of his wheel leaning against a rock while he was getting a drink of water. And she found this, she took a photo of the wheel without Myron, um, which I think is quite hilarious. Um, she also mentioned in the same letter that um, Myron had a reputation for being quirky, but um, say what you will, the guy actually, uh, accomplished the feat of building the AT and there's something to be said for that, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but there it is, the wheel. And um, I had mentioned Mills Kelly. He just went to the Appalachian Trail Museum a couple weeks ago. And uh, he said, A, the wheel is huge. And B, the wheel is incredibly heavy. It's made out of, uh, it's got a steel frame and, uh, he said, I can't even imagine pushing this thing 2,000 miles. And you got to figure he did, you know, well over that because a lot of sections he had to do more than once. So he, um, Avery followed up the trip by publishing a letter to the New England Trail Conference. And he made, of course, Walter got CC'd on this letter, but he made a special point of calling out Walter Green. And he said, blazing the trail over Baron Chairback is the greatest single-handed piece of trail work that I know of. And I hope you will see to it that his efforts receive the recognition they deserve. Um, if he could have had $50 more, so up to hire to do some of the clearing, it wouldn't have taken so much of labor and mental and physical strain on him but I want everyone to remember that the main trail is due solely to his efforts. So in 1937, very early in 1937, Walter Green um, had developed cancer and he was checked into a rest home in Long Island, New York. And this was one final turning point in the relationship between Avery and, and Walter Green. Um, Avery continued to correspond with Green, offering support and apprising them of trail happenings. He was also, Green was also the, um, the main Appalachian Trail Club president at the time. Uh, he got sick and Avery was trying to give him enough correspondence to keep him involved, but quite honestly, he was getting more and more tired and it was taking more strain on uh, for him to try to keep up with that. And so um, Avery didn't know that. He, he thought it was offering help to try to keep him involved. Um, he, was, he was getting concerned because several months had gone by without him hearing from, from Green. He hadn't heard from him since April of 30, um, January of 39. So four months later, he sent a letter to the home, to the head nurse inquiring about Green's condition. Um, and, and it's pretty remarkable. The woman was very frank with him about the fact that Green's health was deteriorating. And the only thing that was keeping him going was sheer determination. Um, she asked that the correspondence be slowed in terms of uh, work 
but um, kept up in terms of um, keeping his balloon um, pumped up. So to you know continue to give him news about the trail, but please don't give him any more work to do. Um, Avery wrote to Green after receiving a letter from Green himself, and he said, um, this was wonderful. Your old, old familiar handwriting was the most welcome thing that I've seen for many a day. I just sat there and stared at the envelope, the same old illegible writing and gray paper and everything else, but you don't know how it made me feel just like old times. I have been more worried about you than you will ever know. Again, you know, very, very human side of Avery that um, is seldom seen from a from an all business kind of guy, very heartfelt, very warming. And Walter Green died on February 20th, 1941. He was 69 years old. Um, and um, as I, I'm paraphrasing what I wrote in my book, but um, performing on the world's greatest stage as he had won the respect of theater goers, directors, and critics. But perhaps most remarkable, he had won the love and respect of one of the toughest critics of them all, Myron Halliburton Avery. Amen. Um, some of you may know that there's a um, there's a marker up on um, the Barren Chairback Range, not far from where that shot is taken, on Monument Cliff. It's a plaque dedicated to Walter Green. Um, and it's a, just a really touching tribute that's up there uh, on top of the mountain with the view. Myron took his wheel home with him, but uh, you're, there you have a 1939-ish view from Monument Cliffs up near Monson. So that is the story of Walter Green and uh, the, the human side of Myron Avery. So thank you very much.